Let's move around the depression map again and focus this time on situational factors, specifically on major life events. For many years, I've collected research on depression, including the various risk factors. None of my risk factor files is as thick as the one on major life events. And indeed, this is generally considered to be one of the strongest, if not the strongest, risk factor for clinical depression. Now, what is a major life event? Essentially, it's an event that's beyond the normal day-to-day -day experience of an individual that strains or exceeds their ability to cope. Not all life events are negative. Getting married and moving to a new country can be positive developments, but they too take some readjustment. I sometimes think of life as being like a highway. Most of the distance, you can see the road ahead of you, and the curves tend to be gentle and predictable. But along the way, there are always some sharp bends in the road and some tunnels that you go through where you don't always see the light at the end, and you don't entirely know where you're going to come out. These bends or tunnels are the major life events. Thomas Holmes and Richard Ray really started this work in the 1960s. They created a list of major life events and assigned a numerical value to each one. The largest was death of a spouse, and it was given 100 life change units. Others were given less. The idea is to go through the list and tally up the items that have happened in the last six months. In some cases, people total the items from the past year. And in some cases, you can score the same item more than once. If two close family members died recently, you would count the death of a close family member twice. The higher the score, the more life change a person is said to have gone through recently. And this seems related to their vulnerability to depression over the coming year. Now, obviously this is a rough measure. Some life changes aren't on the list. And everything that is on the list is a bit variable. Getting married, for example, is listed as 50 life change units. Well, for some people this means leaving home, moving in with their partner, and completely changing their life. For others, it means going through a ceremony at City Hall with someone they've lived with for years. Obviously, one of those is more of an, uh, more of an adjustment than the other. And many of the items are a little bit vague. Change in social activities, for example. Maybe I joined the rowing club. Does that count? Even with those problems, though, we still see a relationship with depression. Now, I've included a sample of the Holmes and Ray measure with this lecture in the notes, so you can try it out on yourself if you'd like. Keep in mind that the test cannot predict whether a person will have depression. It only gives an indication of risk. I find its best use is to help remind people that they've been through a lot recently, and so they need to make self-care even more of a priority than they usually do. We will all have periods of greater turmoil in our lives. Part of navigating these periods is to know when to slow down and give ourselves time to readjust and recover. Now, the Holmes and Ray scale isn't the only way that life events have been looked at. There are many research paradigms, and they all tend to show roughly the same thing. Lots of adjustment increases depression risk, particularly when the life events involve the loss of something. Emigration, for example, involves the loss of your past home and many of the people you used to know, even if you're moving out of personal choice. One of the reasons I like this kind of scale for 
all its faults is that it conveys the idea of the intersection I talked about in an earlier lecture. Most of us can handle things in our lives, even big things. But when multiple challengers occur closely together, that's when we often get into emotional trouble. We move, we change jobs, someone dies, and a relationship falls apart, all pretty close together. We might be able to handle any of them, but all at once, it just overwhelms our ability to cope. By the way, it's not just the major life events that trip us up. Smaller scale events, what we might call daily hassles, have also been researched. Things like commuting and minor medical problems and construction happening next door. And it turns out that a large number of these at one time also puts us at higher risk. What do we do about this? Well, I've been saying that this course isn't really about treatment. But first, when life deals us a lot of hassles or major life events, we can use this to ramp up our self-care. We might not take on that extra work project or decide to renovate the bathroom this month. And we might push the amount of exercise we get and watch our diet. And second, we can look at our lives and see whether we're doing anything that results in us having so many life events and hassles. Are we adopting a high stress lifestyle that's putting us in harm's way? Some of us routinely overcommit ourselves so that we're constantly feeling rushed and stressed. Some of us are incapable of saying no when other people ask us to do things. And some of us imagine that we can only be happy if we earn a huge salary and drive a really expensive car. And that might not be true. Does life deal you stress? Or do you create a stressful life? And if it's you doing this, how's that working for you? If it's not working too well, maybe there's another path.